Welcome to the High Proposal of Activists, Learn Languages, Make a Difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Diego Lopez, and today we're going to tackle a crucial futuristic issue. Can blockchain save endangered languages? We're joined today by Julio Alejandro, CEO of Jada Consulting, Taming Disruptive Technologies. Julio, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Very glad uh, to provide some information about blockchain artificial intelligence and the use of disruptive emerging technologies towards the protection of endangered languages like Ladino, Judeo Spanish, and any, any other language that is uh, problematic in the world. It is certainly a fascinating topic and opportunity. And why don't we begin by just uh, the most simple question that I can ask you. For those of you who don't know you, though you have a lot of successful talks as a CEO and at different universities on YouTube as well. What can you say about you to introduce uh, the topic? Sure. Uh, so I was a political journalist, Mexican-American, based in Chicago and in the United States, reporting about the identity, the culture, and the problems that they had uh, with the diaspora of Mexican and Latin American immigrants in the United States. From there, I saw the problem of being unable to communicate and create a mass movement towards the protection of these identities that have been endangered. As such, I decided to immigrate to the United Kingdom. I began my career as a tech entrepreneur and investor. I founded Humanitarian Blockchain as the founder of CEO in 2016, and we provided technologies towards the refugees uh, from the Middle East that were emigrating towards the jungle in Northern France. Then out of this knowledge that we won prices, that we would talk within different international organisms, I began creating other systems, other technologies across the world that were successful, different universities, such as the University of Oxford and Cambridge, the United Nations and the European uh, Union, uh, the University of London School of Economics, King's College, even MIT and Stanford in the United States, asked me to provide the blueprint on how can we use technologies for social and humanitarian purposes. And as such, we also have solutions towards endangered languages. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you talked about humanitarian blockchain. What is blockchain, first of all, and then what makes it amenable to humanitarian purposes? Sure. Uh, blockchain it works as an interactive notebook that can record information language, grammar, syntaxes, the history of a community and language with certain characteristics that the current and existing, the outdated and old uh, systems, internet systems, were not able to. So uh, it provides different alternatives to stop the corruption, malinterpretation, abuse of certain information towards any human error that an academic or a scholar might upload towards the politicization of a language, Judaism and the state, the Medina of Israel with the different communities might have, might become in danger or attack to try to falsify or use the truth, the history in their advantages, but also towards any blog or, or problem that exists on the cloud, on the system. So what it does, is that it also creates an interaction manner, an interaction and automated way so different scholars can do multiple research on parallel and the truth would be the closest to the most uh, technologically way possible. Let's imagine that we have four different professors, one of them in Argentina, in the United States, in Israel, and in the UK. And everyone is researching a different topic a topic about grammar and linguistics, about history and textbooks, and about archaeology that they would be making in Spain or in Israel. This different industries, these different subjects with different professors will create different outcome, different research. Each one of them might be contradicting each other. 
So what the person that is focused, the Israeli is focusing in Spain, will have a different focus of what is the American focusing on, uh, on, on Brazil. Mm -hmm. So whereas there was new discovery, there would be different inputs. The beauty of blockchain is that it uses what is called consensus algorithm. Proof of work, proof of stakes, different terminology to relate to the same concept that the new information will get got together as terms of new pieces into the puzzle to create logic and coherence. So all of the research that hundreds of thousands of people would be doing, uploading different testimonies, different uh, historical records, mm -hmm. books, notebooks, different information from tens of thousands of person at the same time that cannot be concentrated by one single scholar or by one single center or university whereas the university of new york or the center of hebrew and jewish studies in the university of oxford there is not a single unitarian centralized coherent organization that has dozens or hundreds of experts in a language that can protect it Mm -hmm. That is decentralization in blockchain to help multiple hundreds of students with that they don't have sufficient time, computer information, or even communication to create coherence about what a language is, how to store it, and how does the different and new inputs can be coordinated as different pieces of a puzzle so it makes sense and it is automated uh, online. Mm -hmm. The decentralization of blockchain technology is, of course, fascinating because it prevents monopoly, it prevents violence. And at the same time, though, even though the information is completely decentralized, it can be accessed by anybody who wants to, to access that information. Is that correct? It is an open source system and it is the evolution of the current internet that is based on what is called proprietary system. Mm -hmm. Before, one needed to have monetary access and pay thousands or millions of dollars towards JSTOR and many of the online publication services. Whereas with cryptocurrency, there is a new economic incentive to pay the researcher, to pay the author, the person that spent 20, 20 years of their life uh, understanding, reading, analyzing certain texts and providing information towards a culture to get remunerated out of their money. That is a system that did not exist in the past that was on, based on donations and monetary fundraising on a, on a benevolence side of it. But nowadays, this incentive mechanisms, this game theory and number theory that exists within DAOs, the centralized autonomous organizations, allow the payment for researchers and for people that want to contribute, that want to have certainty that their money is being used in the most efficient, logical, transparent way uh, to use smart contracts. So any kind of research, mm -hmm. let's say that you have a project that will take you three years or five years, and you're asking for $200,000 upon the completion and of every single step, there are five steps that upon the completion of the first step, certain money will automatically be sent to the bank account of the researcher. Upon the completion of the second step, and then on the third step, and, so, and continuously, that money will be transferred into them. Mm -hmm. What is the difference in this sense? That in the previous system, if the professor changes his mind, uh, disagrees with the authorship, has any decides to do a PhD or a postdoc in another industry or another university, that research stops and it is very difficult for a new researcher to come and to try to solve this kind of problems or maintain the same project. And the lack of accountability because of the lack of transparency uh, gives less incentives for donors to get their money and for them to have a direct stake to become shareholders upon projects as the protection of future languages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say that we have established that this way of preserving languages is preferable for a number of reasons, right? Decentralization, privacy, transparency, access, accountability, incentives, etc. 
And now we have decided that we're going to preserve an endangered language such as Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, the language spoken by the Jews who were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula in 1492. And we're going to use this blockchain humanitarianism in order to further the preservation of this language. Where should we start? Um, so I'm asking now for the practical side of these theoretical insights. Mm -hmm. Can anybody start? Who should start? How? The very positive thing about blockchain and economics or incentive financial technological uh, economics is that many of the CEOs or the people that work in this very advanced system of disruptive technologies, many of them are Jewish. Mm -hmm. So the biggest and most important blockchain projects, the two largest and most successful that exist until nowadays is mm -hmm. called BitNation, created by Susan Tarkovsky, mm -hmm. Polish, Swedish, Jewish, and venture capital called Pernomos. Mm -hmm. by uh, uh, Patrick Friedman, grandson of the Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. that is also American Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they have and think not only about the protection of, 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 uh, of their parents or great-grandparents' language, being that Ladino or Yiddish, but about the existence of future and alternative civilization through blockchain, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and biotechnologies. Mm -hmm. So this group of people that you can get in touch with them. There's a third one that is called Aragon, like the like the region in, in Spain. Aragon. Yeah. Spain, yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, created by Luis Cuende. Mm -hmm. And this group of people, they call themselves political humanitarianists. That rather than using academia or legal or economic or even artistic uh areas or industries they use technology mm -hmm. so they think about how can we protect these languages cultures and civilizations using advanced forms of technology and these three ones could be the first step mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so anybody can 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 begin this preservation of ladino through blockchain and and what kind of infrastructure should we set up if we want this uh, to be a reality? Should we, can, can we or should we share, uh, set up our own, for instance, coin, our own currency? Um, would it be convenient to set up our own digital identity, etc.? How can how can Latino as an imagined community, virtual imagined community, come into fruition uh, to help preserve Latino? So there are two answers for this. Uh, Ladino is, uh, an, uh, as you mentioned, a virtual imagined community uh, that needs certain infrastructure. That infrastructure already exists and is created within a membership club that organizes and get together with, that allows individuals to organize, determine what are the problems, arrive to consensus, and try to create different projects and make a funding available for that through one concept that is called smart contracts or automated and future contracts. Mm -hmm. That as, as I mentioned before, when mm -hmm. certain characteristics are met and the whole community agrees about the standards, the grading, the mm -hmm. quality of the outcome of the result of each project, people will move forward to create that oracle or that middleman that is technologically driven, mm -hmm. fair and precise, to provide accountability and to provide the funding for different uh, projects. Uh, if it is necessary to create a coin, uh, we have been involved with dozens, not sure if hundreds of crypto projects that are ethno-linguistical, cultural identity projects, a coin for the Muslims, a coin for the Native Americans, a coin for the Jews or for people in Iceland and in Scotland. Those projects, the ones in Iceland and Scotland, were among the top five or top ten more, most famous seven years ago. None of this identity politics coins, if we can call it this way, or ethno-linguistic ethno cultural coins have uh, succeeded because of the background and the interest that many of the developers have. Almost all of the blockchain people and of the Bitcoin First entrepreneurs 10 years ago, 
90% of them were anarcho-capitalist, libertarian, cypherpunk, crypto-anarchist, very free market oriented. Mm -hmm. As such, they see themselves as individuals, but those individuals have the rationality to try to think about the existence or re-existence of previous historical communities like Sephardat or yeah. like the Shetels or the Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. As such, there is a possibility that approaching and as the ecosystem, the ideology, the group of people, rather than the technology, as the community of blockchain increases and people learn about the creation of alternative civilizations through blockchain, they will be interested in how to maintain and preserve what is a future with different identities, digital identities, whereas the national linguistic one, national linguistic territorial one, as the courts that they're a nation that doesn't have a nation, or the Israelis that they didn't have a nation on that they created Israel, or a, na a linguistical nation like Spain, where they speak Spanish, Portugal, where they speak Portuguese, or Ukraine, where they speak Ukrainian, as this borders and identities and cultures, they get denationalized. That's an important factor. That's an important question. In blockchain, it does not only demonopolize, it eliminates the monopoly of the central state, of the central bank to the production of money and the construction of an economic system. How? Through cryptocurrencies. The same ideas are used by seasteaders, mm -hmm. special governance zones, mm -hmm. biohackers, mm -hmm. startup societies, mm -hmm. and a number of what is called uh, under the umbrella term of uh, intention communities to build physical and geographical communities that would allow the recreation and the existence of a physical city of Sefarad, La Ciudad or Ciudad, because I don't speak that well Latino, unfortunately. You're getting Ciudad, there, you're getting there. Already I'm taking, taking Oxford for classes, I've heard. I, 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 I got a very good professor. I'll introduce yeah, you. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we'll create a city of Sefarad. Mm -hmm. Not that it's virtual on the cloud, on the internet, etc. But we'll ask permission for a nation state, one of the 184. And the people that I mentioned, Luis Cuende, uh, um, Luis Cuende, Susan Tarkovsky, and the Freedmans are all group of people interested in the denationalization of the territory. The only thing that we need is that the donors keep helping us in this very initial moment. We expand the classes in Oxford and futurely other universities. Once we have 500, 1,000, or 10,000 of Latino speakers, there is one example a group of people that ideologically motivated decided to create a whole state. And that exists currently in New Hampshire. It's been their 20th anniversary. It was created by Jason Sorens in his PhD in Yale, the university in, in New, um, uh, whatever, in New Hampshire? No, New Hampshire, voila, uh, Yale University. Uh, that he said, why don't all libertarians that believe in free market capitalism get together in the same state and we just occupy it and we all get together, live in a community, etc. This is for political purposes, but this is one of the examples how we can get it done for cultural and linguistical purposes too. So the example you gave is, is an example of an intentional community, right? Yes. A community of people that get together based solely of on their shared intention of doing so yes without mediation of any as you said identity policies right without mediation of race or country of origin on the sole basis of a shared uh, intention to get together and yes and that is called the free state project in new hampshire has mm -hmm. currently five thousand members mm -hmm. but there is a network in the united states of around 100 hotels or intention communities mm -hmm. led by Synap usually that holds between 20 to 500 people each and they try to fight the system what they call the capitalist neo-colonial racist system and creating communities where the neighbors care about themselves those are local villages 
and they exist all across the United States. And the website to visit and to see the core differences between them is www.startupsocieties.com or .org. Mm -hmm. And we can see how this, this ideas of the nation state, it is disrupted by people that use blockchain with the idea of denationalize, mm -hmm. demonopolize, mm -hmm. defragmentize, deterritorialize, mm -hmm. say in Spanish, desterritorializar. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is called decentralization. It's when right. you eliminate the centralism towards mm -hmm. the protection of a free market that is a free market of language and where people like you and me and the people that are watching this channel want to promote the idea of sustaining endangered languages, it's time for us to use this existing infrastructure that was built in 1973, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 1973 to 1976. These ideas started creating place. Mm -hmm. The early, the cyberpunks and cyberpunks in 1980, late 1980s and early 1990s decided from San Francisco to create the first three early cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and therefore create a protocol and a platform that would give birth and the opportunity so everyone like you and me that want to become entrepreneurs of civilizations or entrepreneurs of languages, identities, and cultures can use these frameworks that are ideological and ethical, but mm -hmm. these frameworks that are also a technology that didn't exist five or 10 years ago to create and to maintain our purpose. Mm -hmm. So the idea of disruptive technologies, you have explained it very well now, specifying exactly what it means, the nationality, the territorialized, etc. And where does the taming disruptive technologies come in? What, what, the, what, the, what does taming mean in this particular collocation? Taming is, is, is about the future of this uh, on very advanced and futuristic concepts mm -hmm. that many times do not exist in academia. Mm -hmm. And if they exist, they have multiple and different names. So first, let's define how, what are disruptive technologies? We usually identify them according to seven technologies. The most important, the two most important and famous one, it is blockchain that is divided within cryptocurrency, smart contracts, DAOs, and blockchain cities. Mm -hmm. The second equally as important is artificial intelligence. That is an umbrella term for talking about machine learning, robotics, uh, deep learning. And the third and on is uh, the use of quantum uh, mechanics and quantum uh, computing technologies, mm -hmm. of biotechnologies, including Internet of Bodies, of what we call as mixed reality, mm -hmm. which includes augmented and visual reality, uh, automated vehicles like drones, but also submarines and driverless cars, mm -hmm. and IoT, Internet of Things, that involves or is correlated also as telecommunications. Mm -hmm. These disruptive technologies, 80% of them exist almost entirely within three industries, mm -hmm. uh, fintech, sharing economy, and smart cities. Mm -hmm. We could add banking, the financial sector, debt, etc., but it's largely outside uh, and has no correlation with uh, linguistics, uh, sociology, humanities, and the social sciences. Mm -hmm. To the extent that at the moment, as we speak, uh, we need uh, a teacher, a professor, a human to be using these technologies. The technologies cannot do them by themselves as we speak, because we are in the first of the four or the three process of artificial intelligence, uh, artificial um, narrow intelligence. Within the next eight to 12 years, we will achieve what is called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And that would mean that the computers will have the exact same knowledge and capacity of research, analysis, and interpretation than any human being. When that reaches the point within a decade or so, we will have to question ourselves as a human species and even as a linguistic idea, where does concepts of humanity, civilization, knowledge stands where a computer is just as smart as us? And within 20 to 30 years, we will arrive from narrow to general to super artificial intelligence, a process called singularity by Wright Kurzweil, a book that he wrote 15 years ago. And that would change everything that we have. 
Neuralink, one of the companies of Elon Musk, one of the venture capital companies of Elon Musk, has demonstrated the possibility of telepathy, meaning within the next months or years, we will be able to give this same interview without moving our hands. And the people receiving will be able to understand it. So how does that change linguistics? Mm -hmm. The two areas for us uh, people, sociologists and people interested in these ideas is called NLP and ANN. Those are subdivisions of artificial intelligence. Uh, ANN is artificial neural networks and NLP is natural language processing. Mm -hmm. That I'll give you an example. We have uh, a book that has 500 pages, but every five pages, one of the pa every five pages, the page one of the pages is off. So we have page one, two, three, four, five, six, and boom, mm -hmm. we go into eight. Mm -hmm. The eight, nine, ten, and boom, we arrive until fifteen. And from fifteen until twenty-five, there's no information. Mm -hmm. So can artificial intelligence be used to reinterpret and give? certain understanding of what is the concept that exists on those broken links or on those broken pages? The answer is it is very possible. And also it would allow us to understand if the person that is writing a manifest, a document or anything, was he writing it correctly? Mm -hmm. Syntaxis, its grammar, everything inside of the creation of language, is it correct or is it a variation? And therefore, we can make the distinction between what is a language, a dialect, or many other of the interpretations of the localism and regionalism. Uh -huh. And we will be able to identify also if there are differences between if the language is written in Cyrillic, uh -huh. in Hebrew, uh -huh. um, in Latin, or in another uh, language. What are the differences of how do people express themselves? Same person. But when we when we speak in Spanish or in French or Portuguese or another language, our personality changes, our method or culture or identity changes. Uh -huh. So artificial intelligence is able to map and to create charts and visuals that can provide a chronological order of Ladino or Yiddish on any language that express from 13th century, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, etc. How does this language evolve? According to what? as many variables that we want. They can be geographical uh, variables. So we can explain and express how did Ladino was used in Istanbul against Serbia, against Bosnia, mm -hmm. against Greece, or against the immigrants that went to the United States. And where did a concept that originated in France immigrated to Spain and then immigrated to Istanbul, but those immigrants from Istanbul moved to Amsterdam, which is also a Sephardic community. And from Amsterdam, they went to Brazil and they gained a different language and pronunciation that ended up in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and all of this maps that is very difficult, if not impossible for a group of experts or for a human to be able to identify all these concepts, a machine will be able to express and visualize very simply and easily within a technology that will be available within the next months, mm -hmm. maybe a process or period of mm -hmm. three to 10 years at most. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And I believe that these are, you're basically opening a, a broad horizon of ideas and expectations. And I think there are many people, not only just in our YouTube channel, but in other universities and everywhere, excited about these ideas that want to get to know most of these concepts and implement them and for those people that are watching do you have any recommendations as to available and easy to understand resources that they could get their hands on to begin with do you mm -hmm. have and specifically i'm thinking about a handbook or a written source that is easily accessible and websites they should familiarize themselves with or could sign up for in their in the in the beginning of their futuristic journey sure i have uh four recommendations mm -hmm. uh and two sources mm -hmm. um andreas antonopoulos which is the biggest and maximum authority of bitcoin and blockchain wrote two books that when he wrote them he took a year to write them published them and said this information is no longer valid 
everything changed, mutated. Right. In disruptive emerging quantum technologies, everything changes. So okay. your two sources of information has to be first Twitter and second Telegram. Mm -hmm. When we talk about a book, it's about the history and right. the previous creation of them. Therefore, uh, there are two websites that are basically and very important to understand because they mix advanced technologies with social sciences and humanities. The first one is Singularity, as I said, created by Ry Kurzweil mm -hmm. that expresses all of the uses of disruptive emerging technologies like automated vehicles, drones, IoT, mixed realities, biotech, etc., to use for the use of, mm -hmm. of social sciences. And the second one is The Marginal Revolution by uh, Tyler Cohen that wrote a book called uh, The Great Stagnation. Why is it that we academics or we people that lecture in, in universities and scholarships and etc., we still use as pen and a paper the same way that was created in Oxford and people used to write these concepts 500 years ago or a thousand years ago? Why is it that our phones and our um, technological products evolve disproportionately every few months and the tech and the phone the smartphone that we have on 2010 is old antiquated and useless whereas the same systems of thoughts and ideas and teaching is very similar as it existed ten thousand years a thousand years ago mm -hmm. and the answer is because we have stagnated that's what tyler cohen says in right. this mm -hmm. website uh that is called the marginal revolution. Mm -hmm. The two biggest and greatest authors, in my opinion, are called Balagis, Balagi in Francais, Balagis in Spanish, and he's a Twitter, Balagis Srinivas, uh, that talks about the creation of alternative civilization himself as a venture capitalist. This is very important. The other one that I want to recommend is Naval, Naval Naval in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the relevance of him and the t of, of the of this tune is that they have skin in the game mm -hmm. they inv actively in fundraise money from external investors and they select identify what are the best projects across the world mm -hmm. and they put their money with their mouth this mm -hmm. that creates whole different systems between an academic that has a lot of ideas but no responsibility upon what he claims or do or says or anything i can someone that has a direct damage he gets hurt and punished if he does the wrong things in his life uh -huh. so this two balagis naval marginal university and singularity university are among the best sources that we can have to mix and match human sciences with technology and then it wasn't it Thomas Sowell that once said, uh, I will never trust somebody who doesn't have to pay for the consequences of their errors in predicting the future or politics or et cetera. Talking yes. about, about, about academia, right? How he wouldn't trust academics precisely because this lack of incentive to be right. Yes. Uh, you know, responsible for the economic uh, results of, the, of those. Uh, Decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. There has to be, and this goes back to the accountability and game theory and incentives and disincentives, right? This, this is super important because it's called market governance. Mm -hmm. We have no possibility neither to create or shape the future of humanity through democracy and voting. Mm -hmm. Statistically speaking, one person against 200 or 1,000 has no numerical capacity to influence in one way or the other. So rather than us as a scholars are trying to give classes or workshops or maintaining the ideological sphere that has very limited impact, how are we using exponential technologies with quantum impact of information that creates an economy of scale that creates virality, that virality, so this information works like a virus and spreads, and uh, that is scalable on an algorithm, on an exponential or logarithmic way. So it's not information or a class for 20 people, but this video will get logarithmic if I ask my friends, my parents, everyone right. that we have around, so we can have tens of thousands of views. Please right. like this button, subscribe to this channel, and uh, learn about these ideas that we have. All right, absolutely fascinating, brilliant. Thank you so much, Julio Alejandro. I hope you have inspired as many people as I think you have. 
and uh, I hope to, to see you in, in future editions of this channel as well as in Oxford so you might talk about the digital development of technologies for the preservation of Ladin. Thank you. Thank you for the honors. Thank you for everyone that supports these ideas and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much again.